So today what we're going through is some review stuff from what Zach went over. So we're going to go through so recitation two. And today is all about Newton optimization and KKT. KKD conditions. Okay, so I know a lot of you have probably seen Newton before. So what we'll do is we'll do just a quick run through, um, or I'll kind of just write it out again in, in two different types uh, that we're, we're going to see most often in this class. So the general gist of everything, the reason why we do this, and I think this is important to like not forget this. So actually out of, out of curiosity, if you don't mind speaking up, how many of you guys are a little confused by sometimes we hear people talk about, oh, we're going to linearize it and use Newton, like find a linear approximation. And then other times we hear, oh, we're going to fit a quadratic to this and use a quadratic approximation. So I know in my case, when I was first getting involved with this kind of stuff, hearing those two frames Simultaneously, it was kind of confusing because I was like, well, are we approximating it as linear or quadratic? And, and why do I keep hearing both these things? So I'm going to try and clear up exactly why we hear both those, um, what those mean, and trying to like bring everything back to the root definition of it. So what Newton does is it finds roots. So what is a root? Root. Any x, it's going to take some residual function r, it can be whatever function we want to. Any x such that r of x equals zero is considered a root of x. Now, the issue here is that we, we can't just solve this magically, right? There's some cases where, you know, if it's a linear function or if it's like some trig functions that I'm very familiar with, in an exceedingly rare number of cases, you can solve this thing directly, but most of the time we can't. So the question becomes, okay, well, if I can't solve this thing, directly like so for instance if I were to give you um this be a cool example if I were to give you like x1 squared times tang of x2 to the power of cosine and up here I had sine of x3 to the fourth power divided by e to the x1. If I were to tell you that I wanted you to find an x such that this thing equals zero, right? There's no way you could do it, right? Unless this was like some magical special case. I could look at this function and I can't look at this and I can't solve this just using like the math that I know to give me the X that's the root of this function. Now, if it was something much simpler, if it was like A times X1 plus B times X2, then X2 minus three of X1 equals zero. So basically this, there's no way I'm solving this, but this is solvable, right? This is a linear function. I can use substitution. I can figure this out. I have two equations, two unknowns. I can easily look at this and solve uh, the second equation for what these things are supposed to be. So the idea is that I can't solve for roots in a generic sense of just any function, right? This would be extremely challenging to do so. But if you give me a linear function and it's two equations, two unknowns, and I have the same number of equations as I do unknowns, and this I can solve, okay? So now if we look back at our original problem statement, we wanna find a root of X. What we can do is we can say, okay, I may not be able to solve for any generic function, R of X equals zero, but what I can do is I know I can solve the linear functions. So what's the first step we do is that we are going to take a first order Taylor series, which is our best linear approximation of this root function. And we are gonna do the following. So say I have some current iterate, this is x of k, x k, current guess. So x k is not quite zero yet. So I'll do, you know, r of x k is not equal to zero. So x k is not a root yet. Like maybe it's close, maybe it's not, but it's not a root. All right, r of x k is not equal to zero. But what I'll do is I'll take the first order Taylor series of this. I'll say r of x, I'm going to approximate this with the first order Taylor series, which is r of xk, because I'm taking the Taylor series about xk, plus this Jacobian dr dx evaluated at xk times x minus xk. Okay, so this is my first order Taylor series. 
I'll set this to zero. So I can't solve for when the function equals to zero, but I can take a linear approximation of the function, and this I can solve to zero, right? This is now a linear function in the variable we're trying to solve x. So if we just do some quick moving stuff around, we'll get negative r xk, get this Jacobian. And what we'll see is that we now have x equals negative dr, I'll write this out a little differently, equals xk minus dr dx xk invert r xk. So just like that, I didn't do anything crazy. All I did was I took a function. I said, I'm trying to find the zero of it. I'm trying to find the root of it. Um, but I acknowledge that I cannot solve generic nonlinear functions for when they equal to zero. But what I can do is I can take a first order Taylor series, form a linear approximation of that function, and that I can solve really easily. <clears throat> so all, that's all I had to do. And just like this, I have one iteration of Newton's method. And by that, I mean, I have one, if, if the X that I'm solving for is my next iterate, because this is an iterative method, I'm gonna get better and better over time. I'll say this is XK plus one. I'll write this out in colors to show that we did this differently. So this right here is kind of, it's my recursion. It's me saying that my next iterate equals my current iterate minus this thing right here. And this thing right here, we call the Newton step. And if any of you guys have done like machine learning stuff, we know that we like computing step directions. And that normally makes the line search a little easier and learning rate a little easier. So now I'm going to rewrite the Taylor series using the delta formulation. So if you guys saw like in the quiz, I was like, all right, which two Taylor series are like the legit Taylor series? And in the last recitation, I talked about kind of the two Taylor series we're looking at. So now I'm going to write this same thing out that we did up here. I'm going to write this out in, this, in the second way that we're used to seeing it. And that is R X plus Delta X equals, this is K equals R of X K plus DR DX X K Delta X. And remember, I wanna set this equal to zero because I wanna solve for when the linearized version of my function equals zero. So this last lecture, um, or last recitation, I talked about how, you know, this is the Taylor series. And this is also the Taylor series. The only difference is that we just said that uh, we just defined the delta to mean this. And there's no, like this is, if I just take this definition and I just say this, you know, this is true. If I take this and I plug it into this and I get this thing down here. So there are, here are the, the two different, I'll just write one, two. Here are the two types of Taylor series that we're, we're gonna see over and over in this class. Sometimes we write them in just normal way. And sometimes we substitute in this delta function to make things a little bit easier. And we just define what this delta is and we plug it in, it looks like this. And um, in most cases, we'll end up using the second one just because this makes a little more sense because we like computing step directions. We like that delta X. So now if I solve for this, I get delta X equals negative dr dx xk r xk. And the reason we like this is, you know, in general, this is no different. This is the exact same thing as up here. But the cool thing I can do is that now I can do XK, sorry. Okay, so here I'm saying, here's how I compute my delta x with the Newton step. This is my Newton step, as Zach will call it. And then here I just have, I'm gonna update x. So xk plus one equals xk plus some alpha times delta x. And this alpha, this is why we kind of like writing these down in style, is this is our step size. Also, if you come from more of a learning background, this is our learning rate. Um, and it's nice solving for things in terms of deltas because then I can use a backtracking line search the same way that you saw Zach do lecture yesterday. So in general, when we're talking about Newton steps, this is what we're talking about. All right, so I think that is good for generic Newton. An option do, uh, just because in my case, I know I usually learn a little bit better from seeing like a graphical interpretation of everything. 
So I'm now going to kind of draw out what's happening in the 1D case. Um, and a lot of you have probably seen this kind of stuff before. But so let's do, say I have a function like this, and this is my R of X, and this is my X. So when I say I'm looking for a root, what I mean is that I'm looking for um, the X that sets this thing equal to zero. So the first question you may ask is, why is this this hard? I just plotted this whole thing. Um, how can it be difficult to find when this thing equals to zero? So that's one way to do it. But if you think about it, I had to evaluate this function at every single point to plot this, right? You know, hundreds, thousands, potentially even millions of points. I had to evaluate this function R of X at, and then looking at it, I can be like, okay, well, it looks like the zero happens right here. So the key is that we want to find when this zero happens with the fewest number of function evaluations of R. That makes sense. So what we do is that we start with some initial iterate here. I'll call this X of K, X of zero. And again, with Newton, we always need initial guess because we're going to form that Taylor series about some point. And we want that initial guess to be as close to the root as possible, such that our linearization ends up being accurate and our Newton steps converge quickly. So our initial guess is right here. So the first step is you start with X zero, you evaluate R of X zero, you see that it's up here. And then you're going to form a linear approximation of this, which is in the 1D case, it's just me putting a line. And I'm going to solve for when this linear approximation equals zero. This is us computing the Newton step. We're computing what new X, given this linear approximation, sets R of X equals zero. And that goes right here. So then here we have our X1, and then we go and we evaluate R of X1, and we see that, oh, we're actually not, we're not at the zero yet. So we do the same thing. And we do another line, solve for when this thing equals zero, X2. And you can see we evaluate this function again up here. This time, do this. X3. So my drawing skills are terrible. Hopefully the idea is coming through that we're just basically forming a line at each point, solving for when that line hits zero, and then relinearizing and, and doing the whole thing again. The idea is that I made the convergence look a little bit slow the way I drew this because I was doing a bad job drawing. But in general, this uh, is extremely aggressive in terms of the convergence rate. So it is the number of digits of accuracy are effectively going to double every single Newton step once you're in the basin of attraction. So you hear Zach talk about a basin of attraction. What he means by that is for all of these root finding problems, there's gonna be a period where a region of this space in X where my Newton steps are gonna be productive and my linear approximations are gonna be close to the real function. And once I kind of like reach that region, it's gonna converge very, very quickly, which is why like you saw in class, he did like, you know, three, four iterations, it converges down to like one E minus 15. So this is a graphical interpretation of Newton. So now let's talk about optimization. Uh, hey Kevin, mm -hmm. is the convergence mostly quadratic or it can be like cubic or something like that also? Sorry, you asked if the cost function is quadratic? of the convergence of the uh, Newton's method. Sorry, the what's of Newton's method? The convergence of the Newton's method, like how uh, fast do Yes, yeah, so it converges quadratically is, is the, the buzz that you'll hear everyone say. And there's like a million different proofs of this. And it basically just says that the, when you say, when you, someone tells you that the convergence of an algorithm is quadratic, what that means is that I have some error term at each time step. And it means that the error term of the K plus one time step is the error term of the K time step squared. So like this is a small number, right? It's less than one. So when I square it, it goes down, down, down. So when you plot like a convergence plot and you see like error and then iterate, you'll see it on a semi-log plot, it'll like dive down. This is like, you know, one E1, one E2. Right, that kind of thing. On like a log plot, the convergence of this thing is quadratic, it will just, it will dive down. It's just because we have this relationship between the errors at each iteration. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? Hey, yes, yes, it answers. 
Uh, just my another doubt was, is it like maximum uh, quadratic or it can be more than that as well sometimes? Um, so if a function is it's something called that self-concordance, if a function is self-concordant, it's a derivative condition on the third derivative. And it for there are special functions where you are more likely to adhere to this sort of convergence. Um, and I'm not sure if there's a specific function in which you are guaranteed to exceed this convergence rate, but I'm, I'm sure it's possible. Uh, obviously the function is linear, your convergence is you converge in one step. So I think in general, quadratic convergence is great. And I don't know if we can have any use of arguing that we have something better for a specific function. But yeah, this is like of all algorithms for convergence, there is nothing faster than Newton's method in terms of like the algorithmic complexity. Thank you. So now we're going to move to a topic that we're going to do a ton of this semester, which is optimization. So in general, our optimization framework is that we're trying to minimize some. Um, we have some variable x. We'll call this our primal variable. We're trying to minimize some function f with respect to x. And so what we do is that we say, OK, how do we know if we've minimized this function? We're looking for an optimality condition. So for unconstrained problems, our KKP condition which just means our optimality condition is simply that the gradient of this function with respect to x must be equal to zero. So in the, in the case where this is a one day thing, I'm looking for this point right here where the gradient's flat. And if the gradient is zero, then that means that I've reached either a local minimum or a maximum. If the problem is convex, there are only local minima. So I'm looking for my first order necessary condition says that the gradient must be zero. My second order sufficiency condition will tell me, is this a minimum or a maximum? But for right now, and for a lot of the stuff we do in this class, we're, just, we're looking for a, uh, an extremum of, of either min or max, and it will almost always be a min. So for unconstrained optimization, we assume the problem is convex, like this shape right here, we'd be searching for this. Um, and so what we'll do is that we'll say that we have this optimality condition and what does this look like? This looks just like a root finding problem. This is me saying that I'm looking for an X that'll set this function that takes in an X and spits out the gradient and set that thing equal to zero. So what I'll do is I'll just rewrite this as R of X equals some gradient function. And now I have Newton's method. Now I can just plug it right back into my Newton's method I did earlier. So what you'll see is that when we do this for um, an optimality condition, let's, let's go ahead and take those Newton steps. So what I'm doing is I'm saying delta x equals negative Jacobian of the gradient. Oops. Jacobian of the gradient evaluated at xk inverse gradient fx. And this is x, k. So the, here is the computation of our Newton step. So if you look, this is the exact same thing as before with Newton. We just have our residual function is this gradient function. And what we'll notice is that this term right here, this is, so the Jacobian of the gradient, if you think about this, and you'll have a question on your quiz about this, the Jacobian of a gradient is just the Hessian of the original function. is just this right here. So what we're doing is the Newton steps when we're doing unconstrained optimization are just delta x equals negative Hessian xk times the gradient of xk. And here we have Newton's method for unconstrained optimization. And what we saw is that this was me simply using Newton's method on a residual that was the gradient. The gradient must be equal to zero. This is my residual function. If I do Newton on this residual function, I get this term right here. And then we go, oh, the Jacobian of the gradient, this is the Hessian. It turns out that here are our Newton steps. So here is where you hear people talk about like uh, approximating this thing as quadratic. Because what this is doing is that this is uh, the exact same thing as the following. If I take a second order Taylor series of my function, min x, and now I do opposed to f of x, I'll do 
XK plus gradient F XK transpose uh, delta XK plus one half delta XK transpose Hessian XK delta X. If I take this optimization problem, which has a quadratic objective function, and if I set the gradient of this new function to zero, so we're, we're gonna go over this a little more explicitly in just a moment, but basically here's my second order Taylor approximation of my objective function. And if I were to solve for the minimum of this, what I would get is the exact same thing that we had earlier. I get this delta X equals negative Hessian gradient where Hessian gradient. So this is why people say that solving for Newton steps in unconstrained optimization is the same as me quadratically approximating my objective function and solving for the minimum of that function. So I'm not, I'm not gonna dive into these details as to how do we go from here to here um, because I'm gonna do that for a different example that hopefully will be more helpful for your homework. So that's going to uh, conclude our kind of first stab at Newton's method. We're gonna revisit it in just a moment. But in the meantime, I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of go through some stuff that you've probably seen before um, that you may not have understood like how simple the derivation really was. So what I'm gonna talk about now is least squares. So I'm sure all of you have done least squares at some point, you've all seen the normal equations. So you've probably all seen something like this. Um, and so here I'm gonna show you why you don't really have to spend time like memorizing this or the, the left pseudo inverse or the right pseudo inverse, all of these things are very easily derived from basic principles of optimality. So we'll do least squares. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, overdetermined or skinny systems, as you'll see them referred to. And this is when I have a system like this, I have a tall matrix A such that I have more rows than I have columns. AX, and I want this to be equal to B. But the system is overdetermined. There are more equations than there are unknown. So I, I, in most cases, if this thing has a full column rank, that means the, the dimension of the column space, which is equal to the dimension of the row space, equals the number of columns that we have. So there are no uh, linearly dependent columns here. So this is a, a full rank matrix, as we call it. Um, we will not be able to find an X that satisfies this. So what we can do is we can say, okay, I, I can't find an X that exactly means AX equals B. What I want to do is I want to find the X that is as close as possible. And this is our least squares objective function. So you're saying, I want to find the X that minimizes the norm square between AX and B. So now the first thing I'll do is I'll rewrite this objective function into a form that's a little bit, a little bit easier. So I'll do AX minus B transpose AX minus B. This is because any vector, the norm of it squared is the same as just taking that vector and taking a dot product with itself. So I'm gonna take a very quick aside right here. I'm going to write out some basics that we'll need for matrix manipulation in these equations. So the first thing is that if I have three matrices, these can be matrices or vectors or whatever, and I transpose them, I just flip the order of everything, and I throw a transpose on everything. This is kind of the, the first rule you need to know. The second thing is anything that is a scalar. So imagine if I have X transpose, A transpose B. Say so have something like this. This is a scalar, right? So it's just a number. So the transpose of this is gonna be equal to the same thing. So the transpose of this equals B transpose AX. And because I said this or it's transpose, you know, it's all the same thing because it's just a scalar. It means that if it's ever a scalar, I can do this, this transpose trick and I can flip the order of everything and transpose everything. And it doesn't change the result whatsoever. 
And then let me think, what was the third thing I need to go over? Uh, so we can distribute transposes as well. So if I have the following AX minus B transpose, I can just do X transpose, A transpose. This is me applying the transpose to this thing right here and then transposing this minus B transpose. So I can distribute the transpose like that. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, a quadratic form. So I will, probably should have gone over this first, but I'll do a thing up here. I'll say quadratic forms. And this is a form you're gonna see a ton of and is super important to understand how this works because it's so simple. And we're gonna basically do everything possible to stick everything in a quadratic form. And this is, if I have some function J of X, and this is equal to one half X transpose QX plus Q transpose X. If I have a function that looks like this, we like this because now I can take my gradient of J with respect to X easily. This is just Q of X plus Q. And I can take the Hessian of this easily. This is just Q. So as far as our like matrix derivatives go, we really only just need to put things into this quadratic form. And if you ever have any general questions about how to differentiate these matrix expressions, this website This website is fantastic. You can type in any expression you want to, like basically in MATLAB code or just write it out and it'll tell you what the derivatives are with respect to any argument that you want to. So if you ever have to like double check something, um, this is matrix calculus is gonna be an awesome resource. But the, the main takeaway here is that we like things in this form, this quadratic form, because these derivatives are very simple. They're just functions of the major series and vectors that we have in these spots. So we like things in quadratic forms. And we now know how to matrix manipulations. So we now have the, the tools that we need. We know how to take derivatives of things in quadratic forms. And we just learned kind of three basic rules for how we can manipulate these matrices. So let's go back to our least squares problem. We're trying to minimize X, AX minus B. And what we'll see is that I now wrote this out as just the dot product between these two vectors. So I can go ahead and expand this. I can do B transpose or yeah, I'll do X transpose, A transpose minus B transpose, AX minus B. Now I can just use FOIL, expand everything out. It gives me X transpose. I will throw a one half. If I throw a constant in the cost function, it does not change the minimizing argument. It's just gonna make the derivatives a little nicer. So I'll throw the one half here, one half here, X transpose, A transpose, AX minus B transpose, AX um, minus X transpose, A transpose, B plus B transpose, B. So the first thing that we'll notice is that I have a B transpose, B term in here. So any constant term that I add to a cost function does not change the minimizing argument. So I can ignore this. This gives no x. If there's no x in this term and I'm minimizing over x, then I don't care about this term. If, I, if I'm just adding the term there. Now, the next thing I'll do is I'm going to transpose this thing right here. Transpose this. And what that gives me is 1 half x transpose, a transpose, a x minus B T A X minus B T A X. And so, you know, these two are equal. And then what we'll do is that we'll add these things together, but also I'm gonna go ahead and I'll transpose this term right here. Um, and it'll be clear in just one moment why I'm doing that. One half X transpose, A transpose A X minus a transpose B transpose X two. So do you guys agree with me that taking these two things and put them together gives me this? 
I can just take these terms right here, transpose it, and just flip the order. And so it, again, it may not be clear right now why I did this, but it'll be clear in just a moment. So this is now my least squares cost function. Right now in this form, I'll just make my handwriting a little cleaner here. X transpose, A transpose, A X minus A transpose B transpose X. So just in a few lines there, using just these three um, tricks to matrix manipulation, I took our least squares cost function and I wrote everything out and I kind of worked through some basic reduction steps. And now I have everything here in my quadratic form. So remember it was variable transpose matrix variable plus vector transpose variable. And now I have things right here are in that same format. So I'm happy with this. I have, I'll call this thing, this matrix A transpose A, I'll call this Q. And this vector right here, I'll call this little Q. And what we said about quadratic forms is that we love them because they're super easy to take our derivatives of it. So if I had this cost function here, which is min of this thing, one half AX minus B, squared, this problem is the same as min x one half x transpose a transpose a x plus a transpose b transpose x. So I took my original least squares problem and I transformed it into, I'm now minimizing a quadratic, which we love. We want things in quadratic form. So the next step, is I'm going to take the optimality conditions of this function right here. So I will call this j of x. So again, lambda x of our cost function j. This is equal to a transpose a x plus a transpose b. And what do we say our optimality condition is for unconstrained optimization? That I want this gradient to be equal to zero. So I have minimized this function when my gradient of x is zero. So if my gradient is just this simple function right here, and I set the thing equal to zero, I notice that this is linear in my term x. And what that means the is I can just solve this. Negative, right? Sorry, go ahead. The second term will be oh, negative. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. This is minus, minus, thanks for catching that. Minus. And now I just have a transpose a x equals a transpose B. And here I have the normal equations, which I can solve by just doing X equals A transpose A inverse A transpose B. And this is this section right here. This is our pseudo inverse. Pseudo inverse for skinny A. So just there we saw, we took our original least squares cost function and we wrote it out in this form right here using some basic matrix manipulations. Go ahead and scoot this over to make this a little more readable. And we then minimized over this function right here, which is in our, our, like our favorite form, it's a quadratic. And I minimized this by setting the gradient equal to zero, which is linear in our function X. I can just solve it like this and then solve it like this. And here's our least squares solution. So this is what we do when we have an overdetermined or a skinny system. Now let's talk about the second thing we'll see, which is a fat system or an underdetermined system. So instead our system looks like this. I now have more variables than I have equations, which means not only can I stat if this thing again, if this is full row rank, so none of these None of these rows were assumed are going to be linearly dependent. All the rows are linearly independent. What I'm doing here now is I want to find an X such that AX equals B, but because I only have a few equations I have to satisfy, I can do so in an infinite number of ways. So normally what we do in this case is that we're looking for the least norm solution to this equation. So this is also commonly called a least squares problem, um, but it's, it, the optimization problem that it's solving is fundamentally different. I'm minimizing over X. And I'm going to do one half the norm. I want to minimize the norm such that, and I'll have a constraint, 
AX equals B. So do you all agree that my goal here should be, if I want to find an X that AX equals B, I want to find the X of minimum norm such that AX equals B, and this will guarantee I'll find the solution of all the solutions that satisfy AX equals B. This problem will find the one that has the least norm. So now what we'll do is that this is the constrained optimization problem. I'm going to have X is my primal variable. And lambda is my dual variable. So the first thing I'll do is I'll write out the Lagrangian of this function. Lagrangian is a function of both the primal and dual variables. And this says one half x transpose x. And again, the norm of x squared is the same as x transpose x. So one half x transpose x plus lambda transpose times ax minus b, and I'll go ahead and I'll just rewrite this just to keep the conventions clean. ax minus b equals zero. So I now say that this is my Lagrangian for the system. And my optimality conditions are the following. My KKT conditions. The first one is that the gradient of this Lagrangian with respect to x must be zero. And this is um, x plus a transpose lambda. And then also uh, we need primal feasibility, which in this case also happens to be the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to Lambda. But I actually, I don't like using that convention. I think it ends up confusing people. I think if we stick to the KKD conditions, we just apply those to everything. It's a little better. And so what this is saying is that we also need AX minus B to equal zero. So here we have our, our two KKD conditions for equality constrained problems. So this is stationarity. And this is primal feasibility. So here are two KKT conditions for these problems. And what we'll see is that we have two different ways we can solve this. So the first way we can solve this is we can just put this all in a big linear system. Since this is all, it's linear in the variables we want to solve for, X and Lambda. We can be okay, perfect. I can just do um, identity, A transpose, A zero, X lambda equals zero B. So I could do this. And if I were to solve this linear system, this would give me the X that is my least norm solution to A equals B. Alternatively, I can be a little smarter about things and I can do some substitution. I can start with um, X equals negative A transpose lambda. That came from this right here. I just moved this to the other side. And I'm now gonna plug this in. So I'm gonna plug this thing in to the following, into my A equals B condition. So again, both these things have to be satisfied. So I have two equations, two unknowns. I'm just gonna do some substitution and now I get A, A transpose lambda equals B. And then I can solve for lambda equals negative A, A transpose inverse B. And then from here, I can just plug this right back in to the original equation. X equals A transpose, A, A transpose inverse B. And here is our other pseudo inverse. So just to go over what we did again, we're talking about least squares problem. You've all probably seen the more Penrose pseudo inverse for both these cases. And what we said is that in the case where A is skinny, so there are more equations and there are unknowns, that this is our optimization problem. And we worked through and we found the solution to this problem is just solving the normal equations, AKA solving this right here, which gives us our pseudo inverse is just gonna be the component right here that gets multiplied by the vector B. And the second case we looked at is when there are more decision variables than there are equations, and we know that we can satisfy it. So then we set up a new optimization problem where we're trying to minimize over the norm of X subject to the AX must be equal to B. And then we formed our Lagrangian where we have our dual variable Lambda, which corresponds to this one equality constraint. And we wrote out our two KKT conditions, stationarity and primal feasibility that correspond to this problem. And we showed that we can just solve these things, you know, naively, since this is a linear system in both X and Lambda, or we can substitute and we get out our classic 
uh, pseudo inverse for underdetermined linear systems. Does that make sense to everybody? So now I'm gonna try and just spend seven minutes real quick going through um, one other optimization thing. And then the last 10 minutes, I think we'll talk about questions or I'll go over like the homework or some quiz stuff. So now I'll write out in a more generic case, if I wanna minimize some function f, I can do the same exact thing I did before. Again, I say x is primal and then lambda dual. So write out my Lagrangian. C of X, and then I'm gonna say my optimality conditions. The first one is that the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to X must be equal to zero. So gradient F plus DC DX This must be equal to zero, and then C of X must be equal to zero. KKT. And this is the exact same as what we just did earlier, but now we're just, we're not assuming anything about the cost and constraint functions. We're just leaving them as F and C and we're writing out our generic. The first one is our stationarity. The second one is our primal feasibility. And we say is that we want these things to be equal to zero. So again, these are nonlinear functions. So I can't solve these things exactly the way I did before, but the tool that we just learned was we can use Newton's method to solve for residual functions that we want to drive to zero. And in this case, our KKT conditions is just another fancy residual function. Here, we're just saying that R of X and Lambda is We just want to drive this to zero. So here we can see that the KKT conditions that we wrote down for this constrained equality constrained optimization problem, we can write down the KKT conditions such that we have another root finding problem. And then what we'll do is that we'll write down the Newton steps. So we'll say delta X, delta lambda. So here I'm using like the delta notation again, equals, and now I have to write the Jacobian of this right here. So take the Jacobian of this with respect to each variable, and here's what I get. I get Hessian of the Lagrangian. I get DC DX transpose, DC DX, I'll remove this minus, and put it elsewhere. Then we get zero, negative gradient of Lagrangian, negative, C of X, K, I'll make that super clear. This is evaluated at X, K, Lambda, K. So just like this, I wrote down for a system like this, where I say I have a nonlinear residual function. I can't solve this in closed form like I could the least squares problem. Now I have to use a root finding method, Newton's method, to solve for the X Lambda that satisfy these optimality conditions. So I said, this is a residual function. Now I can write down my Newton step for this. And what we'll see is that we have a term in here that, that's pretty interesting. So this works and this is full Newton. So you'll hear Zach talk about full Newton. This is what he's talking about. But let's take a look at this Hessian de Lagrangian. The Hessian de Lagrangian is the Hessian of the cost function plus D, DX, DC, DX, transpose lambda. So the issue here is that this function is really expensive to evaluate. If you can imagine, if the constraint function C was linear, then DC, DX would just be a matrix and D, DX of a matrix is just gonna be zero. So if the constraint function is linear, this term leaves, it's not there. If the constraint function is nonlinear and I can differentiate it twice, which I can in nonlinear cases, this term is gonna have some value. So um, this gives us the, what's called constraint curvature 
constraint curvature. And it basically is going to bake in information about the constraint into my Lagrangian um, and into this Hessian when I take my full Newton step. So it's incorporating all the information. And the, what we can see is that we got this full Newton step, but just naively just saying, okay, here's a residual function. And let's just plug in what we know. We know how to take Newton steps. Here's the Newton step of this. And boom, we got full Newton. But in order to evaluate this Hessian Lagrangian, it turns out there's a really expensive term in here to compute. And so the question is, can we still solve this without doing that? And the answer is yes. So here we can do the Gauss-Newton step. And basically what we're gonna say is that we're gonna be lazy and we're not gonna compute the full Hessian Lagrangian. We are, we are going to ignore this part. We'll just assume that we linearize the constraints first or something, or just, we're not gonna worry about the nonlinearity of the constraints. We're gonna just ditch this term off our Hessian. We're just gonna turn this into the Hessian of the cost function. And this is Gauss Newton step. There we go. Here is full Newton, where we use the Hessian of the Lagrangian right here. And then Gauss Newton, I just have Hessian of the cost function. So full Newton is going to, is mathematically the correct Newton step, but there's, there's two reasons that we're concerned here. The first reason is that this is expensive to compute. So sometimes it can, it can take too much time that the fewer number of iterations it takes full Newton to converge may not be worth it. And the second thing is that oftentimes in control, we choose our cost function. Right, like we design what f of x is. So we know that if we design a nice convex function f, which we'll learn a little more about, um, I can guarantee that the Hessian of this function f is gonna be nice and positive definite, which means that this will be a descent direction. So this Newton step will be like a safer bet. And if I don't do that, if I instead use full Newton, I have this term here, this can corrupt my nice Hessian and it can make it potentially negative definite. It can add negative eigenvalues into my Hessian which means I have to regularize and it makes things more difficult. So Gauss-Newton is very popular and controlled because it, it guarantees it will have nice, safe step directions that are actually descending in cost and it's less expensive to evaluate. But the downside is that it takes a few more iterations to converge and how many more iterations it takes is very problem dependent. So I think that's all I wanted to go over today. So now we have 10 minutes. Um, and you guys should feel free to ask any question you want to about uh, the quiz that we had last week or the homework zero or just general stuff that Zach's been going over in class. Um, all these things I'd be more than happy to go over. And then as usual, this video is recorded. It'll be on YouTube. And then this PDF I'm going to upload in just a little bit. Um, for the Newton's method uh, way up at the beginning, we just kind of cover the it in a multivariable case? Yeah, so uh, everything I wrote here was works for both scalars and for a uh, multivariable case. So I didn't say, and remember we were being very picky about like the way we write down these derivatives and like the dimensions and everything. Um, in fact, you'll have like a question about this on the coming quiz that you're gonna have. But so yeah, nothing here is specific to scalar or uh, multivariate systems. This step works the same for everything because if this is a scalar, the inverse of it is just one over the scalar. If it's the matrix, then it's the inverse. So nowhere in here that I assume that this has to be one or multiple variables. Everything I wrote down here is entirely general. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, hey, Kevin, uh, I still can't wrap my head around why we use the approximation of using a, a function in the uh, Gaussian method from the Newton method. Like, what's the intuition behind it? Why why do you use just the uh, minimization function instead of the Lagrangian? So you're talking about how can we get away with using this opposed to this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what this comes down to is that the correct, like, so do you agree that this is the correct Newton step? Yes. Okay, so if we look at our KKD conditions and we just say this is a root finding problem and we plug in Newton's method, this computes the correct Newton step. 
And then what we said yeah. is that if we take a closer look at this term right here, what we get is we get this, we get the Hessian of the Lagrangian is the Hessian of the cost function plus this uh, constraint curvature term, which is the Jacobian yeah. of the Jacobian transpose times lambda. And basically what we're saying is that while this is the correct Newton step, in general, this term is the dominant term here. And this term only really adds a little bit. And that's because the constraint nonlinearity is not so insane that the second derivative of the constraints is, is large enough to really make a big difference. And we also run the risk of when we add this, it's expensive to compute and it can give us negative eigenvalues in this Hessian. So what we can do is that we can take this and just assume that this is nothing. And we'll just uh, effectively assume that the Hessian Lagrangian is in fact just the Hessian the cost function. And what you'll see is that for, for linear, if the constraint is linear, this is true, right? If DC DX is just a matrix called A, then DDX of A transpose lambda is just, it's nothing. So it, it basically, it's, it's a very small term in this Hessian Lagrangian, which gives us this constraint curvature information. It turns out in practice, that information is, is, not, is not useful enough to justify how expensive it is to compute. And so we will oftentimes in Gauss-Newton just ignore this. And this is what gives us the Gauss-Newton step. But here also we are taking the derivative of the constraint uh, equation, right? So the first derivative is not that expensive then generally? Yeah, so if you think about what this is, um, my constraint function C of X, C of X is gonna map things I was done. It's, it's in general, it's going to take in a vector X of length N. It's going to spit out a vector um, of length M. So that means that DC DX, remember it has the number of rows as it does outputs, M, mm -hmm. number of columns as it does inputs. So this is a matrix mm -hmm. right here. And computing the first derivative or the Jacobian of the constraint mm -hmm. function, is as we'd expect taking the first derivative of anything. The issue is that when I take the second derivative of this, what I get is yeah. I get a third order tensor. So it's a huge mm -hmm. amount of information I have to differentiate. And it's more expensive than the Hessian of the cost function. And it's generally more expensive than anything else that we'll see. This is doing D DX of DC DX. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. It's super expensive mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, because it will be a third order tensor, right? Because you're yeah. going from in okay. but exactly. I'm differentiating a matrix with respect to another yeah. vector, which means I I append a, a third dimension there, which is for each vector input again. 